Reno, Nevada, desert town and the state's original gaming capital. Today, Reno is hosting a very different kind of high stakes game. A gamble in the sky, known as the National Championship Air Races. Every year since 1964, pilots have been coming to this desert airfield for a week of fierce competition. The Reno Air Races are all about one thing and only one thing, and that's all out speed. It is unlike any other venue in the world. About 100,000 spectators converge on this five day event to watch everything from biplanes to jets compete around an eight mile oval through the desert. The highlight of the event is the unlimited class. Unlimited because anything goes. Both modified and stock World War II fighters. Many of the airplanes have been highly modified just to make them go faster. They are the ones that the fans really love. This year, the buzz is all about Hoot Gibson's good friend, pilot Jimmy Leewood. He's competing in the unlimited class with his modified warplane, the Galloping Ghost. And he's hoping to fly it faster than it's ever gone before. Jimmy was determined to win the unlimited championship. Jimmy told me he had had the airplane over 500 miles an hour. It was really a fast airplane. The Morecambe family have some of the best seats in the house. A VIP box in front of the main grandstand. My father and I started going to the Reno Air Races um, about 1990. It's not like any other event. That's amazing to experience. Ron Morecambe is with his wife, Tracy, his brother, Greg, and their dad. I got some earplugs for you if you want them, Greg. Oh, too many good. The noise is out the fun. <laughs> While Ron's been coming to Reno for years, this is his brother's first time. <laughs> Smell the record, guys. <laughs> the single engine planes race low to the ground around an eight mile oval. The course is marked by 10 pylons, 50 foot tall poles planted in the desert. The finish line is right in front of the grandstand. Hey, how you doing? Good. Who'd hand me that ratchet, right? At 74, race pilot Jimmy Leewood is a legend in Reno. He's raced here for 30 years. Hoot Gibson isn't just Jimmy's good friend, but he's a former astronaut and a longtime competitor of Jimmy's. But Hoot is done racing for this year. I qualified fourth overall in the unlimited competition. But in my qualifying round, I burned a hole in a piston so I was out of the races for 2011, so I didn't get to race against Jimmy. You know, Hood, I'm uh, sorry you're not going to be in this race today. You know what? Oh, Jimmy, tell me why. That was going to smoke your ass. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, next time. <laughs> we were fierce competitors. But dear, dear friends, and I really valued Jimmy's friendship. Today, Jimmy's flying a highly modified P-51 Mustang fighter. The P-51 Mustang is a World War II legend. Fast, agile, and sturdy. The P-51 Mustang is such an iconic airplane. It was one of the first fighters built right at the very beginning of World War II. Since Jimmy's plane was originally built, 
It's been heavily modified to reduce drag and increase speed. Well, good luck, Jimmy. See you, Hood. We're gonna break a record today. Wish I could be up there with you. <laughs> if Jimmy can get the galloping ghost to break 500 miles an hour, his prediction will come true. But pushing the envelope that far comes with a risk. A risk all pilots must accept. You're in a very unforgiving environment. Going that fast, that close to the ground. It was not unusual to have pilots die at Reno. At 4.05, the last qualifying heat for the unlimited class is set to go. Jimmy Leewood is the oldest pilot in the race. Making the final won't be easy. Okay, Ghost here, we're looking good. Roger, Jimmy. Standing by. The competition in the unlimited class is second to none. The pilots that are flying these airplanes are the best of the best. Racer number seven, you are next for the runway. Radio check. Towers on channel one, over. In the tower, Reno Police Lieutenant Amy Newman has a bird's eye view of the airfield. Newman is the ranking law officer on site. One of the reasons why we want to have somebody of rank in there is that if there is an incident, then you want to have somebody that has the authority and the decision-making ability to coordinate and command. You try to plan for the worst case scenario. The galloping ghost accelerates for takeoff. Let's go, ghost! <laughs> right now, Jimmy Leewood has just one goal. In 2011, Jimmy was out to win. All stations on standby. As the pilots get their planes into the air and prepare for the race, Newman listens for a May Day she hopes will never come. Race spotters closely monitor the status of each plane. They're all connected earphone-wise to all the cockpits so that they can listen to any change, any nuances, any statements that would cause any level of distress or a mayday. Now, with all six planes in the air, they line up beside a pace plane. The racers follow that plane towards the start line. And if everyone's lined up correctly, nobody is pulling ahead yet, he's going to say, Gentlemen, you look good. Gentlemen, you have a race. Lee Wood hits the throttle, starting on the outside of the pack. He'll need nerves of steel to catch and pass other planes. We're flying in 100 feet above the ground, and you're accelerating. And at the same time, you've got to be avoiding the other airplanes. You've got to be not hitting the ground, obviously. You've got to be not hitting the pylons. So it's busy. It's real busy. The planes jockey for position at close to 450 miles per hour. It takes one minute to complete a lap of the eight mile course. By lap two, Jimmy's in fourth place and closing fast on planes ahead. Jimmy did just, just like I thought he was gonna do. Smoke him, Jimmy, go, go. He held back a little bit. And then at about the end of the second lap or, or somewhere in that time frame, I could see he started to make his move. On the ground, Jimmy's team closely track the galloping ghost on their flight data monitoring system. Speed, engine performance, oil pressure, and more. Everything is working perfectly. Looking good, Jimmy. Pressure stable. RPM solid. The Morecambs watch as the galloping ghost passes pylon six near the end of lap three. Looks like the ghost is gaining on him. Jimmy Leewood's now in third place and chasing Voodoo, another P-51. We do get that reverberation on the tower. You can feel it. You can certainly hear it. You're coming in pretty hot. As the galloping ghost rounds pylon eight, it suddenly pitches up hard. What's happening? 
all of a sudden I hear it sputters, gasp. Jimmy Leewood has lost control of his aircraft. No, no. Jimmy, the airplane had deviated some 80 or 90 degrees from the direction it had been flying. This was not a normal Mayday pull-up. When it reached the top of the arc and started coming down, you could see that this airplane was out of control. Everybody realized that there's, there's a big problem here. Jesus. Oh, no. A P-51 Mustang spirals out of control at the Reno Air Races and dives towards thousands of spectators. The airplane's coming straight at me. The last thing I saw was the sunlight shining off the chrome spinner. He's coming right at us! And all I could do was to get down as low as I can. The galloping ghost slams into the ground, just 20 feet behind the Morecambe family. It was literally like a bomb went off. All available emergency personnel to the apron. Next thing I see is this black mass right in front of the bleachers. In just nine seconds, this race has turned into a nightmare. It's the worst disaster in the history of the Reno Air Races. The worst year that we had had previously was 2007, where three pilots died. But never before had we injured a spectator. Luckily, there is no fire. But the heavy impact has showered spectators with oil and deadly debris. I stayed up in the tower to manage the incident command scene. It was really difficult to stay up there, and the natural response of a first responder is to want to go down there and provide your own two hands to a situation. Ron Morecambe isn't hurt. It was just a second later, and I realized I didn't get hit. And I saw my wife. She was bleeding uh, from the head. She had stuff all over her, oil and gasoline. So I grabbed her and got her out of the debris field. And so I turned around and went back to my father, who himself was in shock. It's gonna be okay, Dad. I said, it's gonna be okay. And he says, no, it's, it's not, not gonna, gonna be okay. okay. He pointed over and he says, that's Greg laying over there. It's Greg lying over there. And I looked over back at the booth and I saw my brother laying down, face down on the ground. With the help of a paramedic, Ron tries to save his brother. He has a serious head wound and a faint pulse. But there's nothing they can do. Greg's injury is fatal. I knelt down. I told him I loved him. And then I asked God to take care of him. Ron Morecambe's wife and father are soon transported to hospital along with 62 other injured spectators. The crash kills 11 people including galloping ghost pilot Jimmy Leewood. I knew right away Jimmy was gone. Christ. I knew there was no way that he could have survived something like that. He had been such a dear, dear friend. I just cried. I'm Clint Gertschakes, it's Howard Plagans with the NTSB. We've been authorized to take over this investigation. Investigators from the National Transportation Safety Board are already on site promoting air safety awareness. They've witnessed the crash. Watching the accident happen was quite unique. We saw the airplane pinch up, roll over, hit the crowd, 
and the three of us working were stuck. Portions of the airplane ended up uh, about 100 yards from where we were sitting. It can sometimes take days to start an investigation. But Howard Plagans and Clint Cruikshanks are at work in just minutes. Nothing can be touched until we get photographs. But nothing moves, okay? We could see the initial impact point and then the debris fanning out across the ramp. Uh, there was chairs, there was aircraft debris, there was liquor from all of the coolers that were in the boxes. It was just chaos. There was just debris everywhere. Now, as they launch an investigation into one of the worst air race crashes in history, the NTSB needs to figure out what caused the galloping ghost to tumble fatally from the sky in just nine seconds. The airplane hit the ground at over 500 miles an hour, and so there was not much left. The largest piece may be measured three feet square, but most of the airplane, especially the forward part of the airplane, was little tiny bits. And even the Merlin V-12 engine was totally broken apart into individual cylinders. Explaining what happened from the shattered debris alone could be impossible. The remaining air races are canceled. Investigators start collecting evidence. All right, listen up, everybody. We need every piece, no matter how small. So take your time, okay? And everything you find goes into one of these bags, okay? So let's get going. Thank you very much. A few hours after the accident that killed 11 people, Race volunteers and emergency workers are collecting debris to be stockpiled in an airport hangar. Thank you. It's a painstaking job. My first step is to make sure the scene is contained and safe. And then let's have them start a grid from the impact point back to Pylon 8 where we know the upset began. And then start looking for any perishable information that we need to gather immediately. Thank you. Investigators want photographic evidence as well. Stills and video of the crash taken by the thousands of fans on site. We asked anybody that had uh, something to contribute, go ahead and send it in. The request turns up some jaw-dropping evidence. We were able to get the airplane throughout the entire race, from start to the finish, and that proved invaluable in the investigation. A searcher finds an airplane part outside the search grid. Where did you find this? Up there? Can you show me on the map here? It was a light piece, and it was far away, further than some of the other heavier pieces. Crookshanks and Plagans wonder how a light piece landed between Pylon 9 and Pylon 1. How did it get all the way over there? Over 1,500 feet away from the crash site. There. We would not have expected to find it where we did. This is great. We expect the heavy pieces to go the greatest distance from the accident site. Good job. And also, all the main wreckage was very dirty, had a slimy, greasy feel to it. This piece was pristine, was clean. This is great. Well done. Thank you. Investigators wonder about the significance of this piece. In a hangar near Sacramento, California, investigators go through bag after bag of collected debris that bears no resemblance to an aircraft. Hard to believe that this morning this was a plane. Answers about what happened will be hard to come by. But the news media is already speculating about a cause. A report featuring a photo of the ghost just before it crashed shows the left tail trim tab coming off. That's the same piece found over 1,500 feet from the crash site. The news reports were reporting that, you know, they had solved the case with the uh, 
the missing left trim tab, left elevator trim tab that had come off. And at that point, I said, well, I think we found that piece. Trim tabs are key to controlling an airplane. While tail elevators direct an aircraft to climb or descend, trim tabs on their trailing edge keep the elevator in place without the need for constant adjustment. If the trim tabs fail, the aircraft could lose control. Why did you break? Did the tab break off and cause Jimmy Leeward to lose control? Or did the tab break off because the plane went so badly out of control? So far, the investigators have no idea. We know that we have a process that is going to drill down the facts and figure out exactly what happened. With so many unanswered questions, it's unclear how long it will take for investigators to solve this mystery. In the meantime, the future of one of aviation's most iconic racing events hangs in the balance. I'd have to say one of the real big questions after this horrible accident was, is this going to be the very end of the Reno Air Races? Oh, Hanky. It's good to have you on board. You bet. I'm glad to have you. Former astronaut Hoot Gibson helped NASA investigate the Columbia Space Shuttle disaster in 2003. No one knows more about this stuff than you, so really appreciate it. Now, Reno race officials have asked him to help the NTSB. He said, you really need to be part of this. And I said, okay, I'd be willing to do that. Investigators want to rule out as many potential factors as they can. They start with the pilot, Jimmy Leewood. At age 74, he was already too old to fly a commercial airliner. Who you knew Jimmy real well. Did he have any medical concerns? None that I was aware of. He was in great shape. Look at this. He had a history of high blood pressure. That's news to me. Did Jimmy Leewood have a heart attack mid-flight and lose control of his airplane? So our medical uh, officer went and talked to Jimmy's personal doctor as well as his FAA doctor. And we always perform an autopsy on the, uh, the pilot of an accident. Investigators send Jimmy Leewood's remains for an autopsy. The report provides conclusive evidence that a sudden heart attack did not cause Leewood to lose control. No drugs, no alcohol in the system, and no sign of heart disease. He was fit to fly. Jimmy Leewood was in perfect health. Jimmy was 74 years old, and his age had nothing to do with this. Having ruled out the pilot's health, investigators turn to Leewood's crew to learn more about the state of his plane. He had a licensed aircraft mechanic as his crew chief, and he also had a, an engine builder on his crew. Those were the two people that we focused on in discussing anything wrong with the airplane. So this is the actual data from the aircraft just before it crashed. The most important thing that we discovered from the crew is that they had a telemetry system on board the airplane that was downloading data. Instead of a conventional black box that stores flight data on board, Reno race planes use a telemetry system. A device on board the aircraft collects data on the plane's performance. That data is wirelessly transmitted to the ground crew in real time. Galloping Ghost recorded a bunch of engine parameters, but also recorded position on the race course, altitude on the race course, and speed. It was a welcome surprise that they had it because it gave us even more information about what was going on. So you would track your performance all week, right? Lap times seem consistent. Investigators learned that as far as the crew is concerned, Friday's race started like any other. 
and that prior to the crash, the plane was performing well. Looking good, Jimmy. This is stable. Even though on the surface the data reveals no issues with the mechanical functions during the flight, investigators want to dig deeper. Speed therapy and look good. Crookshanks looks for clues that Jimmy's crew might have missed. But he comes up empty. Oil pressure seems fine. None of the data parameters help explain what could have caused a trim tab to detach from the plane. But one parameter does stand out. Wow. Look at the G level. G level refers to the gravitational force that we experience here on the Earth. All of us sitting on the ground here are seeing one G. Smoke him, Jimmy. Go, go. In the races, we'd be pulling six Gs. But Jimmy saw one of them. He went right off the scale, more than nine Gs. And the onset rate, it spiked in under a second. The gravitational load on the pilot when he goes into the steep climb is astounding. Christ, Jimmy. It doesn't explain why the plane veered off course. But it may explain why Jimmy Leewood never regained control. Through video evidence, we were able to determine that that G spike was actually in the neighborhood of 17 Gs. 17 Gs is more than five times what astronauts experience on liftoff. It's a knockout blow. I would have been unconscious. Someone 30 years old would have been unconscious. Top Gun would have been unconscious at the G level that that airplane experienced. Oh no. It's now clear. Jimmy. If Leewood wasn't incapacitated before the sudden upset, he most certainly was just seconds later. What's happening? Jesus. No, no. It's very likely that the G forces incapacitated the pilot within a couple of seconds so that the airplane was then uncontrolled as it hit the ground. There was no way he could have steered clear of the crowd. But the spike in G-forces raises more questions. Did the left trim tab fall off, pitching the aircraft violently upward? Or did the violent G-forces of the climb start tearing the plane apart in midair? The demise of the galloping ghost remains a mystery. The airplane was absolutely fragmented, so there weren't any big chunks to look at. So far, the investigator's biggest clue is an 8-inch piece of trim tab that's separated from the aircraft's tail section. But they have no idea how or why it broke off. You know, this plane flew in World War II. It's almost 70 years old. And it was highly modified for speed. Maybe it was too modified. Investigators wonder if years of modifications to the galloping ghost turned a sturdy fighter into an unstable racing machine. They need to learn all they can about how it was altered. We had to learn quite a bit about the P-51, and all the information we had was on the stock airplane. It turned out that this airplane was so highly modified that it wasn't even close to being a stock airplane. All of these World War II fighters are going to have to be modified to make them fast enough. And of course, he had such extensive modifications to the airplane. Hoot Gibson tells investigators he thinks the Ghost was the most modified P-51 to ever race in the Unlimited class. It had the most radically clipped wings of any P-51 Mustang ever. Gibson helps the NTSB investigators compare the P-51's original blueprints to the rebuilt Galloping Ghost. In the war, the P-51 needed all this wing for long-range missions. But a race is only 50 miles. Jimmy needed speed. 
not range. The original P-51 was designed to fly long range, carry extra fuel tanks underneath the wings, and fly at, I think, something like 12,000 pounds gross weight. Well, we don't need that for air racing, so we don't need that much wing. They discovered that in the 60s, the galloping ghost had its wings shortened by eight feet and its tail by one foot, a change that made the plane lighter and more streamlined. The less wing that you're dragging through the air at high speed, the less drag you're gonna have, therefore the faster you're gonna go. In 1983, Jimmy Leewood bought the plane, painted it yellow in 1985, and raced it on and off for years at Reno. In 2007, he began making his own modifications to the Galloping Ghost. I see he overhauled his engine. Took his top speed from 300 to 500 miles an hour, maybe more. But there's one big problem. You find anything on the flight tests? Nothing. Zip. There are no records of Lee Wood ever flight testing the modifications. Investigators can't be sure if the changes he made were safe. It was incredibly frustrating that there was no information. The fact that there was no testing of any of the modifications was alarming to us. What went wrong in the skies over Nevada is still unclear. Until investigators discover a new lead. There. Right there, you see it? I do. Happens all the time. Video evidence shows the plane rolling suddenly further left before pitching upwards. Investigators wonder if Lee Wood flew into wake turbulence that battered his plane. Wake turbulence is an atmospheric disturbance that forms behind an aircraft in flight. Vortices spiraling off the wingtips can create dangerous tornado-like winds. It is so frequent and so common that you're going to hit the wake of an airplane out in front of you as you're going around the race course. And it always seems to roll you steeper, roll you beyond 90 degrees of bank angle. Turbulence could explain the left roll. The left roll upset was consistent with a wake encounter. Did the wake cause the left trim tab event? That's another question. Investigators wonder if Lee Wood got too close to the plane flying just ahead of the galloping ghost, a plane called Voodoo. But they discover that the telemetry data from Voodoo is faulty. Investigators can't be sure of its exact position throughout the race. They will never know if wake turbulence from Voodoo caused the increased left roll. I can't believe it. We could not show that the galloping ghost had hit that wake. It's another disappointment. Look at the safety report. Notes from a pre-race safety inspection of the Galloping Ghost provide investigators with a new lead. A problem with the trim tab fastening screws? We drilled down into the, exactly what that meant and talked to the inspector and the crew. We were able to determine that the right elevator trim tab screws were installed incorrectly and that problem was rectified before the airplane was ever out on the race course. So they say they replaced the screws on the right tab, but they never touched the left one. When investigators re-interview Jimmy Leewood's crew, they learned that the mechanics refitted the screws on the right trim tab as ordered. But there's no record of any pre-race repair to the left trim tab, the one that tore off. They told us they had to re-tighten the trim tab screws on several occasions. So the airplane was talking to the crew. They never investigated the reason for the screws coming loose. The question now, did the left trim tab have a defect that no one spotted? Crookshank still can't answer that question. Can you uh, find me those photos of the tab separating? The piece that broke away is only part of the trim tab. 
the hinge that fastened the tab to the plane's tail has never been found. Without that hinge, they may never know the full story behind the crash of the galloping ghost. Three months after the accident, investigators still don't know why a modified P-51 air racer went out of control and crashed, killing 11 people. So where do you want to start? Anything that looks like a tailpiece. But now that they better understand the aircraft, investigators search the debris with renewed purpose. Wreckage be it large pieces or small pieces, it's always going to tell a story. So you have to methodically go through it and look for those signatures. In December of 2011, investigators finally get a break. They identify a mangled piece of metal in the debris. It looks like a piece of the trim cab assembly. Howard, take a look at this. Wow, it's the critical piece they've been searching for. The hinge from the left tail trim tab. The part that the tab broke away from. The discovery became very important as the investigation progressed. Half the screw is snapped off, and what's left is loose. Examining the trim tab assembly, they discover that a screw that once fastened the tab to the hinge is loose, something that should never happen. It turns real easy. The screw is supposed to be secured tightly by a lock nut fixed to the underside of the hinge assembly. The lock nut is specially designed to grip the threads of the screw so it can't come loose due to vibration. Why didn't the lock nut hold the screw in place? Investigators send the trim tab assembly to an NTSB lab in Washington, DC. Paint analysis of the lock nut leads to an eye-opening discovery. The lock nuts on this particular airplane had some yellow paint on them. The airplane was last painted yellow in 1985. It means the critical part is at least 26 years old. When you go to the FAA guidance, it states that you should not reuse lock nuts like this. The deteriorated nut should have been replaced years ago. That's not all they find. Microscopic analysis of the screw reveals fatigue cracks, evidence that years of vibrating inside the loose lock nut weakened the screw to the point of failure. NTSB, Glenn Kirk, When investigators get the lab results, so vibration finally broke the screw. They believe they've found their smoking gun. We knew that it had been loose in order for it to cause the necessary forces to fatigue the screw over time. Aging parts, a loosely fastened trim tab, and extreme aerodynamic forces, it's a fatal combination. We spent a lot of time to get this one right. 11 months after the crash of the galloping ghost at the Reno Air Races, the NTSB announces the probable cause of the accident. We drilled down into every possible area we could to figure out what happened with this airplane. Traveling at 512 miles per hour, 200 feet above the Nevada desert, a loose 26-year-old lock nut causes a metal-fatigued screw in the P-51's left trim tab to snap, sending the plane into a violent upward pitch. Extreme G-forces instantly incapacitate pilot Jimmy Leewood. Oh no. Preventing him from taking any evasive actions. Jimmy, what's going on? The whole accident sequence happened very rapidly. I'm sure Jimmy never saw himself hit the ground. Jesus. Oh no. No. In its final report, the NTSB finds that fast and loose interpretation of the race rules also played a role in the crash. It did not make sense to do all these major modifications and not do flight testing on it. The time to do that is when you're out over the desert by yourself, not when you're around a crowd of 100,000 people. 
As for the crash survivors, Ron and Tracy Morgan, they've never returned to the Reno Air Races. And Ron still has nightmares. It was a light that was coming out of a dark sky. And if I didn't get out of the way, this light was going to kill me. He's coming right at us! That lights the light off the spinner of the airplane. For Clint Crookshanks, this investigation was unique. This investigation was fascinating from start to finish. We got to look into this old warbird and really see how robust the design was. We also got to see how folks were pushing these airplanes, folks that were doing it correctly and doing the correct modifications and testing. This, unfortunately, was not one of those cases. As a result of their investigation, the NTSB issues safety recommendations requiring engineering evaluations for aircraft with major modifications and improving safety for spectators and personnel near the race course. We have a much safer Reno Air Races because of the recommendations that we made as a result of this accident. And for the unlimited pilots, life in the fast lane goes on. Hoot Gibson won the 2015 Unlimited Championship in another modified P-51. Air racing is really exciting. People come from literally the entire world. I'd say the future of the Reno Air Races looks promising. Yeah. 